I have invited as the first speaker, Melita Shonic. She uh, She's a well-integrated refugee. Uh, <laughs> she's an ex <coughs> excuse me. She's an expert uh, in migration, and uh, Melita will give an overview because it seems to me that uh, both in journalism, in politics, and in academia, one addresses only one small part of the uh, of the issue, as if the rest of it did not exist. And I wonder, and this is what our speakers will say later, is there a vision of what, uh, a long-term vision of integration, or it is short-term policies uh, to win the next election? Because we know that migration issues uh, uh, win elections. So I have invited Melita, she will, uh, this is the format, Melita will give uh, an introduction of about 20 minutes of all the aspects of migration, and then we shall have our experts from Sweden, Italy, and Austria uh, speak about uh, specific cases, because I think we cannot uh, address only uh, one topic with, without understanding uh, the whole. And just a few things, Melita is a migration expert with expertise on designing customized uh, communication campaigns for refugees. She worked as a journalist, UNHCR communication expert in different parts of Europe, Asia, and Africa, and currently she has her own communication agency. She authored different books on migration and refugees. She lectures at the University in Vienna, and as I said, she came to Austria uh, when she was very young uh, with her parents as a refugee. And uh, you know, I've known her for 20 years, I've never asked her if she's integrated. Maybe she can tell us today. Thank you, Melita. The floor is yours. Thank you, Miriana. Am I integrated? Well, I'm not quite sure. I think I am. But it does happen when people see my name only and don't talk to me, that they start talking to me in this very very weird German that is, an, for those who are not German speakers, an infinitive German without grammatical structures. So am I integrated? In my eyes, I am, but that's, I think, very often the case with, uh, with migrants. I'm doing the prequel to integration, because normally in Europe, in the political debate, we say we'll talk about integration because integration is a problem, and then we never get around talking integration because everybody keeps talking about migration and how they come and how they shouldn't come. So I'm doing an overview about the realities and, uh, and perceptions of, of migration complexity. And I can tell you that I think there is no political field where the discrepancy between what is the reality and how we perceive or how we communicate the issues is that big as it is in migration. And if I sometimes sound a bit cynical, that's maybe because I am. <laughs> that's the only way, that's my only protection mechanism. I have some sarcasm when discussing about the migration debate in Europe. So let's see if technically, yeah, it does work. Okay. So I have, um, I have four chapters. One is the stop migration deception, where I will talk about the discrepancies between anti-migration rhetoric and migration policies. The second is the storming Europe myth about Europe's immigration, how we perceive it, how it's being communicated, and what the realities are. Then the closed border illusion, also an evergreen of all negotiations, conferences, and so on. And how border controls have proved inefficient over the last 15, 20 years. It's not a tool of migration management. And then the not our problem paradox. How, why the Dublin system can never work because it's based on the issue that as long as there are no migrants and refugees in my country, everything is well and the others can go and, well, try to solve the problem. So let's start with the stop migration deception. In many countries, we have violent anti-immigration rhetoric paired with tacit immigration policies. 
a modern industrial society cannot live without a certain amount of migration. What we need is regularized migration, but we cannot stop migration. We need to regularize it. We need to stop irregular migration. But the anti-immigration rhetoric is very often not about stopping migration. It's about stopping or combating the people instead of dealing with the phenomenon. So I'll give you two examples. Poland, ah, my, there, there were little flags, but they have apparently disappeared uh, in, in, in this version, the PL, SK, and so on. Anyway, uh, so the, the, two, the four countries that, are, that were in the past most opposed to taking any refugees were the so-called Visegrad states, Poland, Slovakia, the Czech Republic, and Hungary. No, we cannot, there's no distribution, we don't want any refugees, they are distorting our culture, all sorts of very, sometimes very weird and very, uh, and, and arguments reminiscent of different periods of, of European history were brought to the fore. But if we look at the realities, Poland has a massive emigration problem. They lack people. Poland has the largest labor immigration program in all of Europe, and um, uh, in in and this, these are the figures of uh, of the OECD of last year, which is nota bene still a Corona year, where Poland issued sixty nine thousand long term visa uh, plus, and and they have uh, four hundred and sixty one thousand labor migrants from outside the EU. So while they say they cannot take one single refugee from Syria because it will, it will uh, I don't know, dis distort their Polishness, their Polish culture, they do take in migrants. Czech Republic, uh, nearly 200 uh, short-term and, and nearly 60,000 long-term residences for non-EU nationals, most of them labor migrants and a smaller part of them family members who came with the labor migrants. If we look at Slovakia, they uh, made a new visa regime last year for certain occupations where they do not have enough people, like bus and truck drivers, for instance. And they are taking people, or they're inviting people to come from Belarus, oh, twice even, maybe they're inviting especially Belarusians, Serbia, North Macedonia, Bosnia and Herzegovina, Montenegro, Georgia, Armenia, Moldova, and Ukraine. You see, they are fishing in the pond of the former Soviet Union and the former Yugoslavia. And what they, all these countries, by the way, have, a have an emigration problem, as I said. People are leaving those countries, so they need to fill that up. They need the labor. What Slovakia tried is to give incentives to Slovaks who had left the country to come back, but it didn't work. And Hungary um, also, though they are, especially uh, Orban is very outspoken against migration. They say they will stop any migration, uh, but when you look at it, it proves as a sometimes uh, somehow hypocritical argument because they issued last year 44,000 residence permits to non-EU citizens. Yeah, Europe welcomes non-EU citizens when they come by yacht, not by boat. In Malta, for instance. I don't know if you've ever been to Valletta. If you look from Valletta at the harbor, they, you have these huge, expensive yachts from Russians and Libyans who are wealthy. And if they invest enough money, they can get a residency permit and or even citizenship. Malta um, has, um, uh, yeah, they had a huge budget deficit, which they covered by, gold, by a golden visa program. The other countries that are very popular are Portugal, that's the cheapest, by the way, for a quarter of a million of investments you already get, an, you, which means a, a Schengen residency. So you can move all over Europe and no one asks you, where does this money come from? Are you a terrorist? Are you integrated? Um, 
do you speak the language? All these criteria don't count as long as you have enough money. Where does the money come from? Is it organized crime? No matter, as long as you, you, you invest. So that's why I, I would say come by yacht. It's much better than coming by one of these tiny refugee boats. And, the, um, and there are other, uh, the, the most prominent ones are Spain, Portugal, Greece, and Italy, which by coincidence are also the refugee receiving countries from the, from the Mediterranean routes. And then other, uh, I did some research, other countries also pop up on some websites, including Austria, by the way, <clears throat> but these are not so prominent and apparently these programs are not so openly communicated. Do we need migration? No, we want to stop migration, politicians say, but we have two very, very Ill, um, uh, drastic reality checks. One was Brexit, when one of the reasons why they wanted Brexit or they communicated why UK, the UK needs the Brexit was because all these foreign workers are coming to our country and we want to stop immigration, in that case, from other European states. Well, now they have their Brexit and they have an acute, acute shortage of labor um, in, uh, uh, in many um, areas, transport, health, construction, care, agriculture, and so on. And do you remember the COVID quarantines when all of a sudden the caregiver system broke down because we rely in the richer EU states on caregivers from poorer states, be they EU states or be they also from, from Balkans countries that are not, uh, uh, not or not yet members of the EU. So, and then they said, okay, we need quarantine, we need vaccinations, everything for everybody, but the caregivers, please, we'll give them special trains and special flights to Germany and to Austria and maybe even to other countries so that the system doesn't break down. So again, the stop migration deception is a deception because we cannot stop migration because our many systems in our countries would break down. Next chapter the storming Europe myth. Everybody wants to come to Europe, or as one uh, local politician in Styria, which is, is a small uh, province between, uh, south of, uh, towards, towards the Slovenian border, said the world migration must not happen between Graz and Treiskirchen, which is a stretch of 200 kilometers in Austria. This guy does not know what he's talking about. World migration doesn't happen there. We have, um, I think, 100 million of people who are in some way displaced, forced to flee within their countries or outside their countries. They are not, I can assure you, between Graz and, and Treskiv. So, uh, but this storming, uh, storming Europe myth is a very powerful narrative for uh, election campaigns, for, for turning to your own uh, electorate, to your own voters, and it's being used very, very much by politicians. Uh, but if we look at the, f at, the, at the figures, so everybody wants to come to Europe, and we, if we don't have closed borders, then, then millions of people will come politicians say, but it will, if, if you look at the hotspots of labor migration, then we'll see that it's not us, it's the Arab states. You see Qatar, Bahrain, U United Arab Emirates, they have 88% of foreign-born population. Uh, then Oman, Singapore, Saudi Arabia, Jordan, Australia, and then Switzerland. And the, there, the foreign-born population also includes uh, some very, very rich people who don't want to pay their taxes at home. So uh, we are not the hotspots. Europe is not the hotspots. Um, and uh, Switzerland, by the way, isn't even an EU country. Uh, if uh, Also, 
uh, not all the refugees want to come to Europe, or all the refugees want to be between Graz and Traskirchen. In fact, if we look at figures, 85%, 84, 85% of the world refugees stay within their region. They move to the next country. So, um, and it's, uh, if you look at it, the most, most uh, Syrians are in Turkey. Most Somalis are in Kenya. Most, um, most Afghans are in Pakistan and in Iran. So we are not the main and number one uh, destination as Europe. Um, here, if, uh, here you see Ger uh, Germany is number three, but these are new figures that already include the Ukrainians. And of course, where do the Ukrainians stay? In the region, which is Europe. If I had given you the, the statistic from the year before, you would have found Germany on, um, on, 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 on the fifth rank without the Ukrainians. So refugees usually cross the border to be safe. Only very few move on, and sometimes they move on because the countries of first asylum are not being supported. For instance, remember, it took four years of the war in Syria until we saw the first Syrians coming to Europe. Why? At that, um, at that time, and I was uh, still working for UNHCR, and I was in Jordan, and I remember how often UNHCR said, we need more money to support people here. We cannot stabilize the refugee population if they are hungry, if they have nowhere to stay, if we cannot help them, they will move on. And I remember that then some European politicians said, UNHCR shouldn't be so alarmist. Well, what happened? We had the big crisis. And once sort of a, a movement is established, it goes on because other people follow the example. Then there's this myth that Africans are flooding Europe. These Africans, they have so high birth rates and there are so many and they will all come to Europe. Uh, it was all started by a book which was, uh, I can't think of the, of the author now, but it was, it, it was published in 2019, The Scramble for Europe. And it said that now with, these, uh, with, uh, with this young population in Africa, they don't see a future in Africa, and all of them will come to Europe big panic and everybody is talking about the Africans. If we look at the statistic, and that's the uh, European Asylum Agency statistic <coughs> of, um, of uh, 21, we see Syria and Afghanistan are the large ones, and then we have um, Venezuela. No one here is talking about Venezuela because this is happening in, in, in uh, Spain mostly, so we don't care. Uh, Iraq, Turkey, Pakistan, Bangladesh, and then we have Morocco, Nigeria, and Somalia. If we looked at the 22 statistics, which is not on their website yet, then the largest, one of the largest chunks would have, or the largest chunk for Europe would have been the Ukrainians. And rightly so, that's the region. They stay in the region, so they stay in Europe. Then there's the narrative that yes, some migration, we need some migration. We don't want all these people to storm Europe. We just take the, uh, the key uh, sk highly skilled workers, the managers, the expats, the really, the, 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 the computer specialists and so on. But if you look, and maybe it's a bit hard to read, but if you look at the reality, I mean, you don't even have to read the statistics. Go out and look where are the people working. They are working in the areas that are um, either seasonal work, less paid work, dangerous work, um, and, 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 of course, low, low salary work. So uh, foreigners, migrants in Europe are overrepresented in as cleaners and helpers, 11.8% of EU citizens are cleaners and helpers, or the, the, no, the other way around. If you look at cleaners and helpers in Europe, then uh, only 2.9% of the labor force are European cleaners, 
and 11.8% are foreign cleaners. They are overrepresented in personal services, personal care workers, building, construction, and so on. They are overrepresented as laborers in mining, dangerous, um, in um, manufacturing and transport, in food preparation, and in, in the agricultural in industry. And they are underrepresented compared to their quota in the population. They are underrepresented, of course, in teaching professions, in business and administration, um, um, or as professionals in business and uh, administration, uh, in um, general and keyboard clerks. I don't know what that is. It's in OECD statistics. Business and administration professionals, health professionals. So the caregivers, the cleaners in the hospitals are the foreigners. By the way, I know a lot of caregivers from foreign countries who are medical doctors, but they work under qualification in Europe as caregivers and are not even allowed to give an injection to their patients because you are only a caregiver. And how can, could you have as a, as a, with a medical degree from say Serbia or Bosnia, how would you be able to give an injection to an Austrian patient? So the, the, the narrative of the highly skilled immigrant that we like does not withstand re a reality check. Then my favorite, the closed border illusion. Uh, what you see here for those who are not German speakers or, or not in Austria, this is a poster in the, in the, on top. You see a poster where you see the leader of the far right FPÖ. Uh, who uh, promotes a fortress Europe. Uh, on the other, on the little map, you see where there are physical barriers within Europe, um, walls, um, fences, to fend off uh, migrants, because we want to be safe, we don't want these people. And this is the knee-jerk reaction of all migration conferences in the EU, we need stronger border control. We want to seal off the continent. Now, in fact, it's technically impossible, first of all. The sea borders are 43,000 kilometers, which is nearly the equator, more or less once around the world. And the land borders are approximately 7,000 kilometers, much of it also across mountains, through rivers and forests. So it is technically impossible. Let alone, do you want to live in, in a continent that is the free continent of human rights and that's surrounded by borders? That's a different story. But it's just, on the technical side, it is not possible. Um, how does, does it prove efficient? Now I looked at it. Frontex, the EU border agency, was founded in, um, in 2005 and had a budget of 6.2 million uh, euro. And that time, in this year, the refugee population in Europe went down by 350,000. So a lot of people were going back. In, 200, uh, in, in 2022, we have a Frontex budget that's, that is 120 times that high. Uh, all the 27 member states have invested immensely into border control, and we have an influx of, um, uh, in 22, uh, no, in 22 only, which was a corona year, 188,000 people. Um, plus, of course, 4.8 4 million Ukrainians. So it is not because border, con uh, because border control is higher that more people are coming. It's just that border control doesn't really uh, help. Uh, yesterday I talked, uh, sorry, yesterday I talked to a lady, uh, a Hungarian lady, and she told me a very funny story. Because remember, Hungary has this fence towards Serbia to fend off and they don't take any, stop migration, they don't take any migrants. But we know that 
at least 90,000 came last year through Hungary to Austria. And she told me a story. She was taking the train from Budapest to Vienna. And she said that in, on the train, there were people who visibly looked like, I don't know, Syrian refugees. And when the border guards came, they checked everybody, but they behaved towards these people as if they didn't exist. They just, you know, they didn't see them because their interest is just to have them go away. So we see that fences do not really work. So, and one, and that's the fundamental problem in, um, in, in, in the whole migration discourse in Europe. Uh, European politicians see migrants when they are at the border, and then they think this is where we can, where, where migration is starting, and this is where we can also stop it. In fact, it's the other way around. I put some, some um, little uh, stars at, at uh, popular um, departure points. Someone who comes from Afghanistan, by the time he or she, mostly he, has arrived at a Schengen border, uh, they, they have uh, traversed 5,600 kilometers. From Syria, 2,600. From Nigeria, 5,400, and so on. So um, they have walked on foot. They have been in cramped, stifling spaces. They have seen people die. They have, they have traveled on rickety boats. They have witnessed other people die. They've experienced maybe torture, fear, hunger, thirst. They have accumulated, and their families have accumulated huge debts. And then we tell them, sorry, it was a marathon. You, are, you have reached the goal, but now please go back. It's logical that this cannot work. So migration management cannot start at the European border. And I'm always very surprised how uh, European politicians have no other solution than fortifying the borders. At that stage, when you are so close, when you have gone through all of that, as an Afghan, as an Eritrean, you will not turn around. You will risk even more, and you will pay smugglers to move on. Then, of course, there's a thriving smuggling industry. Uh, many European countries say, ah, we are... Uh, uh, we do something against them. We have uh, um, arrested and tried so and so many drivers. The bus driver in the smuggling industry is the last element of the chain. It's like the little drug pusher in a park. This is not the drug boss. So it is an international industry. And even Europol says that over 90% of the people have to use smugglers to, to get into Europe. So they are very happy with the closed border industry. Their profits are going up. Um, the costs only for crossing into, I'm not talking about the thousands of kilometers before, I'm, or crossing, for instance, the Sahara. I'm just talking about the last bit crossing the Schengen border is between two, or was, in 19, between 2002 and 2000, uh, uh, 200 and 2,500 euro per person. Uh, the profits just for border crossing are at least 160 million euro. And the, the whole industry is, there are some, some uh, estimates that, that the whole smuggling, worldwide, the smuggling industry makes half a billion, at least half a billion euro per year. And then, for instance, we have the channel crossings. They are exclusively driven by the smuggling industry because they go and say, you know, you will not get asylum here in France. What are you doing here? We can take you to the, to, to, to the UK. No one can tell me that people need to flee from France to have the human rights realized in the UK. It is only driven by the smuggling industry. And I don't feel that much is being done to stop them. And then there are, I, can, I, I must tell that because I find that so bizarre. Sometimes there are quite bizarre solutions. If we close the borders, we will, uh, people will find very bizarre solutions to still come in. One is that in, nine, in 2016, P 
people were crossing on the very northern point of, of Europe, Kirkenes, from, what's the city in, 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 in Russia? I, I forgot. Anyway, uh, they cross, and since it's not possible to cross on foot this border crossing by Kirkenes, they used old bicycles. So they had a, uh, you know, all the Russians sold their old bicycles to the, to the Syrians so that they could cross into Norway. And there is also, for the, for the people who have some more money, there, is, uh, there are jet ski rides from Morocco to Spain. It takes 30 minutes and costs you 4,000 euros. So, very quickly, because I'm, it's, it's longer than I anticipated, the, the last chapter is the not our problem paradox. Uh, the, the whole system, the whole uh, Dublin system is based on the idea, how can I get rid of the people in my country? So, before an asylum procedure starts, and we know that two-thirds of the people who are in this asylum procedure don't even belong there, they are labor migrants, you have the whole Eurodac fingerprinting uh, and Dublin procedure uh, issue that can take up to two years. So for two years, the people are cared for. Um, they are, you know, the taxpayers pay for them, and we don't even know if they are migrants or refugees. And many countries, many people in many countries are busy with the Dublin procedure. It's a multinational procedure trying to establish that this person doesn't belong to our country, please, you have to take it. Uh, and this is, the, this is the just move on parad or the not our problem paradox. So Austria was very much in favor of redistribution of refugees when they were the external border of Schengen. Now they say no, no redistribution. At that time they said, how can we have this geographical disadvantage just because we are at the outer border of, of the Schengen area? The, the Visegrad states were strictly against any quotas uh, accepting Syrians, but when the Ukrainians came, they were quite happy that other states were also accepting Syrians, uh, Ukrainians, and they did not only stay in, in, in the Visegrad states. Austria works a lot with phantom figures. They complain in all, uh, also in, uh, on EU meetings that last year they had 1,900 asylum applicants. In fact, we know that at least 74,000 of them have moved on. So it's just a phantom figure uh, that, that, doesn't, um, uh, that helps with the narrative. But as long as they moved on, no problem. And it works like that. They are being registered. Then they get a ticket. And they are told, please go to this city, to this Austrian city to have your interview. And then they just go and leave to Italy or Germany or wherever they wanted to go. Hungary claims closed border policy. But we know that they just, as I told you, they just sort of tell the people to move on. Italian authorities, for instance, before they, they fingerprint the refugees, because once they're fingerprinted in Italy, Italy is in charge of, of the asylum procedure, they tell them, you know, tomorrow, the day after tomorrow, we'll fingerprint you. And of course, if they wanted to go to Germany or they have a cousin in Sweden, what they do is they leave the country. And Italy is happy because it's not their problem. So um, if Schengen had worked, and that's my last thing, if Schengen had worked for the past two years, uh, for the past 10 years, I tried to, to calculate that, then we would have, you know, in the past years, uh, 2.3 million people were um, registered at the Schengen border, but 5.6 moved somehow, somehow through and first popped up in a non-border country. If they all had stayed in the Schengen, uh, in the first country of asylum, but that, because that's the idea of the Dublin system works, they stay where they enter Europe, then Greece alone would have had nearly 4.4 million refugees in, four, in, in 10 years. This cannot work. The system is just set up that it cannot work. And these are the other figures which I'm not going to go through, but you see, it could not have worked. And now, but Greece registers them and then they move on. If the next Schengen border had worked, 
which would then be the Austrian and Hungarian border, then 3.1 million irregular migrants who left Greece undetected in the past 10 years would have stayed in the Balkans region. Bosnia, Herzegovina, Serbia, Albania, Nor North Macedonia would then be asked to resolve a problem that the EU is not capable of resolving. It cannot work like that. So the system as it is has a systemic fault. And that's my favorite, the EU summit on the 9th of February. The plan was, of course, strengthening the external borders, because that's always the plan. Then a common list of safe third countries, okay, that, that would now be a legal discussion if that works or not, and measures to force readmission of uh, ineligible asylum seekers by their countries of origin. They've tried that for a long time, but it hasn't worked so far. And then I feel like it's, I feel like in a time warp because they do, they always, and that's the, the uh, a time war dance board for those of my generation who have watched the Rocky Horror Picture Show. Let's do the time warp again. Um, it's really the same solutions that haven't worked in the past 10, 15 years are being now um, promoted again. Uh, what is the solution? Combat irregular migration, not the migrants. Look at the systemic issues. Don't, don't torture the people. Tackle root causes. Help countries of first asylum and countries of transit support refugees and migrants. One of the reasons why we have so many is because, for instance, in Libya, they had a lot of foreign workers. Now that Libya is in shambles, these people move on to Europe. Libya had up to 5 million foreign workers from African countries. Uh, treat those who arrive humanely. Uh, conduct one single EU asylum procedure instead of 27 procedures and 27 systems. And conduct it at the entry point where the people within the EU. Create different legal possibilities for refugees and labor migrants to enter Europe. What is happening now is we don't have a labor immigration system that works. So people who come for labor say they are asylum seekers because very often that's the only possibility to get into the country. Um, return rejected asylum seekers swiftly, not after five years, because that will have a sort of a didactic effect in the countries of origin and introduce meaningful integration policies for those who are allowed to stay. And that is already the next topic that we are going to deal with today.